Well, I hope all the beautiful people of Calvary Baptist Church are doing well today. Before we get to our devotional time, I'd like to just update you or uh, share with you uh, some recent prayer requests that have come in. Now, last night I sent a large uh, group email out to many of you with uh, the recent prayer requests that have come in lately. But those that are most recent, I would like to highlight uh, at this particular time. Remember to please uh, continue to pray for Jasper Stevenson, who had uh, oral surgery yesterday, um, hopefully to help with the speech impediment that he has. And the surgery, as we know, went well, but uh, the jury is still out as to how effective uh, this surgery will be uh, in helping uh, Jasper's speech going forward. So pray for that, if you would. And then I would like for us to really pray fervently for our local and national leaders that God would impart to them the wisdom and the courage that they need to do right. And uh, also along those lines, pray for nationwide revival. And pray for our members who are in law law enforcement and uh, the medical profession that God would keep them safe. And then we need to pray for our brother, Bob Eshelman. He has a possible seizure condition of some kind. And we're just praying that God would direct the doctors to the source of Brother Bob's problem. So pray for that. And then, as you know, uh, Brother Ronnie Connor has been having many health challenges as of late. And you pray that God would come to his aid. Also pray for Brother Rob Craig. He's got a possible hiatal hernia. And then for Meg Craig, his wife, who has several unspoken requests. And then uh, Kathy Eshelman has asked us to pray, too, for her mom, uh, who will be traveling from Tennessee to Richmond uh, very soon. And so we want to remember to pray for her and traveling mercies along the way. Continue to pray for Tony Ayer's grandmother. Uh, She is declining quickly. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, when I recently spoke to Linda, I believe Tony's grandmother is about 97 years old. But it looks like she will soon be departing this life to go to be with the Lord. So pray for the family there and for the grandmother, if you would. Then I spoke with Eva Aldridge a couple of days ago, and we've been asked to pray for her son, Duncan Aldridge, in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, Duncan um, has a married couple who were very good friends of his, and they were in an accident a few days ago in Nashville. The accident proved to be fatal for the wife involved and her husband, Caleb Owens is presently in an ICU in a hospital in Nashville with brain injuries. And uh, so this is heartbreaking to hear. We need to pray for Caleb and his recovery and also pray for Duncan, who has been taking all of this quite hard, as you can understand. If you would, I would just ask you to please indulge me. Um, I have a couple of videos that I'd like to share with you before I get to our devotional time. One video is of my son, the other is of my grandson, and they are recounting a recent experience that my grandson went through that uh, will illustrate to us all once again the power of prayer. And uh, I think sometimes we need to be reminded that we serve a God who hears and answers prayer. Okay, I need to tell you all a story. Um, it's a scary, but kind of funny in a way story as well. It's uh, it's about Shane that Jennifer called and told me today about. Um, Drew, you've already heard this in the boys chat, so you can skip it. 
And I warn you, this is probably going to be a little long of a video, but uh, it's worth it, I think. So she calls, and uh, she's in Wisconsin right now. She took the kids with her. She's visiting family over there. And uh, she tells me the story that her and her dad took Jordan and Vanessa to a store. Well, Shane wanted to go with the rest of her kids because she because um, she's got some sisters uh, that are visiting there. They're all gathered there for a birthday party um, for one of the kids. And so Shane wanted to go with the other kids that were going to a playground. And, um, and so the other parents took the other kids to a playground. And so Shane went with them. And um, so while they're at the playground, they started noticing that his dark cloud was moving in. And there was a lot of, um, well, it started sprinkling. So then a couple of the parents went back home to go pick up the vans to drive over there to take them back home. Because it's about a quarter mile to a half a mile away from the house that they're staying at. So, um, so the vans arrived and then started packing and started loading up the kids and loading up all the like toys and stuff that they brought there. And, um, and so, um, one of the sisters, one of Jennifer's sisters, uh, uh, looked at Shane and said, Shane, can you go pick up that Frisbee? So Shane goes over there to pick up the Frisbee. And at that same time, he, he was like, I need to go potty. So he goes behind a tree. He decides that he's just going to go behind a tree, go potty. Well, one of the vans already takes off because it's packed full of kids already. So it goes home. And then the other sister is sitting in the van and she's got kids in her van. She looks around uh, the field and doesn't see anybody there. And it's like, okay, we must have all the kids. We're good to go. And then goes home. And Shane sees that van drive away. Okay. Now, I'm going to fast forward and then I'm going to come back to, uh, uh, to explain you everything that Shane told from his perspective. But fast forwarding, the, uh, um, the family gets home and they start getting stuff around for the birthday party and whatnot. Well, over 20 minutes has passed until one of the sisters uh, just starts doing a head count and looks around and says, where's Shane? Shane's not here. And she immediately goes upstairs and then as she's opening up the door, Shane's like uh, essentially walking in and he has this look in his face. Um, he... Um, he wasn't crying at the moment and he wasn't angry, but he has this look of that. He was just like went through something traumatic. I mean, he's four years old. And, um, so he walks into the house and then he scans the room and then he sees the other sister, the one that he saw drive away. And he looks at her and he points at her and he goes, you left me at the playground. <laughs> and she walks over to him cause they both were just like stunned at what they saw. The fact that he went all the way home on his own because he only he's only taken that trip to the he's only he only walked to the playground so he remembered everything from that one trip that he took so the one sister hugs him and the moment she does he starts crying um because just like he felt finally at ease and comforted uh, you know for everything that he went through so then they all ask him what exactly took place from his perspective. So they all sat down and Shane's telling him the story of what took place. He says, I was going, I was going potty behind the tree. And then I see the van go away and he, and he said he instantly starts crying. Well, there's a kind of a main road there. Um, and he needs to cross over it in order to get back to the house. And so he says, I looked both ways. I didn't see any cars. So I crossed the road on the other side, on the sidewalk, there was a bench and I sat down on it and I just prayed. He says, he says, dear Jesus, thank you for this day you've given us. <clears throat> Help me to get back home safely back to Aunt Danielle's house and make me as fast as a hare. You know, like the tor tortoise and hare story. And it made me as fast as a hare. And says, he said, and then I got up and I just started walking back uh, in the way, um, you know, back to Aunt Danielle's house. And he did. He went all the way back home because it's not a straight shot. So it's about, a, again, it's about a quarter to a half mile um, the distance between the playground and the house they're staying at. So he walked, <laughs> he walked the whole thing. Um, or I guess slash run. Um, so then he g gets back home and they felt so bad. They felt so bad for leaving him. And when Jen got home, uh, he, uh, he kind of told her the entire story. Um, and Jennifer asked him, she said, now Shane, did anybody stop 
um, and tell you where you need to go or give you directions or talk to you. And he says, no, I just, I sat down, I prayed and I asked God to get me back to the house. And he told me exactly where I needed to go. And it, I, and when she told me that, I just got like, I got chills because for one, the fact that like Shane found himself in a stressful situation. And one of the first things he thought to do is I'm going to sit down, I'm going to pray. <laughs> so that was I don't know. It was a proud moment for me to hear about that. So, and then just kind of also hearing that, you know, he said that well, God told me where I needed to go. So it was just a really cool thing to hear from my four-year-old, you know, that the entire thing. So, um, she sent me some Marco Polos of Shane kind of retelling the story. So I'll post it in here on what he says exactly. But it was, it was pretty cool because Jen always goes over, always talks to the kids and tells them exactly what they need to do if they find themselves in various stressful situations. So if you get if you get kidnapped, this is exactly what you need to do. If you find yourself alone and you need to get back to somewhere, you know, this is what you need to do. And even when we drive around our house here, wherever we're going, she always will ask Shane, okay, where do we go from here? Where do we go, right? And so he's constantly observing um, exactly like when we head into a direction, how do we get there? Where do we come from? Where do I need to go? And so it's really cool that he took those sort of aspects. I mean, he's already a super observant child anyways. So I think it was just easy for his personality to pick up on that sort of thing, but it was cool. It was a little scary, but it was cool. The fact that he was able to just, you know, find his way back home, that God was able to help get him there. A guy, he guided them, him there safely. So uh, anyways, I'll post the video. What happened, Shane? I just got the playground. I was going potty at the playground, and and I didn't see the car drive, and I didn't see the van driving by, by, but I was crying, and I was at the bench, and, but I didn't do it the whole time. I just sat there a little bit, and then... And then I ran, and and then I ran on the grass with my shoes on, my socks, and then and then uh. You crossed the street. I crossed the street and I looked for cars and said nope, nope, and I ran down the sidewalk, and and I ran down the sidewalk, and I prayed to Jesus while I was praying, and He gave me mercy. Well, what was your prayer? How did you pray? Dear Jesus, thank you for staying. Help me to get back home. Okay, I'm down the other house. And, and I ran up the hill and I ran down the hill. And I, find, and I, and I ran down the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. That sidewalk. Yeah. And I finally found this house. You found the house. And then what happened when you got inside? I re Everyone was so happy that I got here. I know it. You did so good. I'm so proud of you, Shane. You got all the way here by yourself. And we thank Jesus, right? Thank you, Jesus, for letting Shane come back home. And for not being scared. And thank well, you for I keeping wasn't. him safe. Well, I wasn't scared. But you were sad. Yeah. Yeah. And I finally found this house. And after I was... And after I was sad, I, I was happy again. I know. I'm happy too, buddy. I love you. Love you. Tonight I'd like to share some thoughts with you from Psalm 37. Um, both tonight and next Wednesday night. And it kind of answers the question, what to do when the bad guys win. I'm talking about how we respond when we do what's right and get penalized while the wicked seem to prosper. For example, your neighbor brags to you about how he cheats on his taxes each year and his home is loaded with the finest in furniture and appliances. He has two luxury cars and all the latest toys and they vacationed in Hawaii last year. And when it comes to you, though, you're honest and you pay your taxes, you give faithfully to the church, 
Your furniture would be rejected by goodwill. <laughs> your one clunker of a car is on its second 100,000. And the closest thing to vacation that you can afford uh, is a day at the lake. <clears throat> it's kind of galling, isn't it, at times? Sometimes it seems like it just doesn't pay to be good. And when the evil prosper and the good suffer, you can be tempted to doubt God, especially if you're the good guy. If you're not careful to cultivate the right perspective, you can be tempted to say, just forget it and join the evildoers. Well, <clears throat> it may help us to know that David had been there himself. Although he had been anointed king as a teenager, he spent the better part of his 20s running from the ungodly King Saul. On several occasions, David did the right thing by sparing Saul's life, only to watch Saul return to his comfortable palace while David went back to a cave. During that time, David and his men did right by a man named Nabal, protecting his shepherds and flocks from bandits, but when David asked a small favor of Nabal in return, Nabal said, in effect, drop dead. David had many occasions to reflect on the problem of personal injustice. As an old man, as we see in verse 25 of Psalm 37, David wrote Psalm 37 to share his insights on this problem. And the psalm reflects the wisdom that David had gleaned from years of walking with God. So the first thing that we see in Psalm 37 is simply this, um, and we see it in verses 1 through 11. When the bad guys win, submit to God. Submit to God. Verse 1 reads, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and withers the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. And then verse 4, so many of you are familiar with, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any way to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Although the word submit does not occur in these verses, it is the idea behind both the negative and positive commands that are given here. Negatively, we see that, first of all, submitting to God means putting off irritation, envy, and anger. Three times uh, in verses 1 through 11, we are commanded not to fret. Verse 1 says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Verse 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And then in verse 8, it says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. 
You get the message. I think God's trying to emphasize the point that we're not to fret. Well, what exactly does this word fret mean in the Hebrew? It means simply to burn. The, ver the verb is in the Hebrew reflexive stem. And because of that, it could be translated, don't work yourself into a slow burn when you see evil men prospering. Don't let it get under your skin. It'll only lead you into wrong uh, as it indicates in verse eight. You know, one, one reason we get irritated when we see evil men getting away with their schemes is that we're assuming that we know how to run the world better than God does. So one aspect of submission to God is to put off such irritation giving God the sovereign right to deal with evil doers in his, in his own time and in his own way. We're also commanded in verse one, not to envy wrongdoers. This confronts uh, the, the selfishness and evil motives that are in our own hearts. Often the reason we don't want evil, evil doers to prosper it's not that we abhor the sin they commit, but that secretly we wish that we could do the same thing. We want for ourselves the pleasures of sin of which they are enjoying, but we must submit to God by judging our envy. And then we're also commanded not to be angry in verse eight. The first word, anger, um, comes from a Hebrew word meaning nostrils. When someone gets mad, his nostrils flare out. And then the second word, wrath, comes from another Hebrew word meaning hot, and it points to rage. The Bible teaches that most anger is sinful and that we can control it. Otherwise, uh, the scriptures wouldn't command us to stop doing it. Anger shows that we're not in submission to the sovereignty of God. We're saying in effect, God, I don't like the way you're running things. It's not fair. I don't deserve this kind of treatment from these wicked people. The bottom line is we're not submitting ourselves to God. A rule of thumb for discerning righteous anger from sinful, sinful anger is this. If I am angry about injustice do done toward others, it may be righteous anger. And this anger should motivate you and I to take appropriate action on behalf of the victims. But if I'm angry about injustice done toward me, it's probably sinful anger. And most anger is selfish and therefore sinful. So, Submitting to God when I see the bad guys winning means putting off irritation, envy, and anger. And then secondly, submitting to God means putting on uh, trust, obedience, patience, and humility as we delight in the Lord. And this is the positive side of David's advice to us. When we see the bad guys winning, we need to shift our focus from the evil doers to the Lord. Five times in verses three through nine, David mentions the Lord by name and five more times he uses the third person pronoun to refer to the Lord. He's saying that the antidote for getting frustrated with the prosperity, the prosperity of the wicked is to be deliberately God-centered. This involves putting on several qualities. We're told in the first part of verse 3 and in verse 5 that we need to put on trust. That phrase, trust in the Lord, is not a hollow slogan. It is a course of action. It means that when evildoers seem to be winning and you're losing, you roll the whole problem onto the Lord and watch him vindicate you in his time, as indicated in verse six. And then secondly, we're to put, we're to put on obedience, as it says in the second half of verse three. Do good, 
dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Leave things in God's hands, trust, and go on with your normal duties obediently before the Lord. Don't let the other person's sin lead you into sin. Do what God has given you to do in obedience to him. And then thirdly, we're to put on patience, as it says in verse 7 and in verse 9. And in verse 7, we're told, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's the hard part of submission, isn't it? The thing of it is, and I found this to be true so many times, is that God does not always act on my timetable. In fact, he usually does not. It may, it may take months, years, or even a whole lifetime for God to act and to vindicate you. But if you trust him to be just and, and, and a righteous God, and if you submit to him, then you'll wait patiently. And the fourth thing David says we need to put on is humility, as he brings out in verse 11, and he talks about the meek. To be meek means to realize our own weakness and sinfulness so that we, we rely on the Lord and not ourselves. This awareness of our sinfulness means we won't self-righteously judge the wicked. Apart from God's mercy, we would act just like they do. Humility means as well being aware of our own inadequacy apart from the Lord, but at the same time of our adequacy in the Lord. Uh, it's, it's interesting and insightful with Paul, what Paul had to write in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, when he said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but, and I think you know the rest, our sufficiency is of God. Meekness doesn't mean weakness, but rather brokenness. A humble or meek person is like a strong but broken horse, powerful yet submissive to its master's touch. Jesus took Psalm 37, 11, as his third beatitude, when he said in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The world says just the opposite. Blessed are those who assert themselves and stand up for their own rights. That's one thing that disturbs me about the culture that we're living in right now. Everybody is overly concerned about their own rights. And there is a point in which, uh, to some degree, that's justified when people are being treated in an unjust way. But I think society would be a lot better today if we, if we would not look to our own things, but uh, also upon the things of others that we would not always put ourselves first, but esteem others better than ourselves, as Paul puts it in the book of Philippians. And so, again, the world says, blessed are those who assert themselves and stand up for their own rights, but Jesus and David disagree. It's the meek who will ultimately come out on top. Can you trust God for that? Does your faith allow you to embrace that? The abundance of peace in verse 11 refers to more so to soul prosperity and not so much to material riches. The person who finds his adequacy in the Lord rather than in himself or his things has an abundant source of peace. And then verse four says, we need to be delighted in the Lord. Trust, obedience, patience, and humility can all be summed up in the phrase, delight thyself also in the Lord. Be captivated with the Lord and all that he is. 
And rather than focusing on the things which the world seeks, focus on the Lord. In gaining the Lord, you gain everything else you ever need because he will give you the desires of your heart if you delight in him. This doesn't mean he will give you anything your selfish heart desires. If you're delighting yourself in the Lord, then your desires will be in line with his desires. And this is this verse here is basically the Matthew 6.33 of the Old Testament, uh, in which it says in the New Testament, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what happens? All these things, all these things that you need shall be added unto you. You know, you could apply these principles to your own marriage or to any relationship. Say that a husband wrongs his wife through insensitivity, verbal abuse, adult, adultery, you name the sin. She will be tempted to get irritated and to be envious. Um, envious because her husband does what he pleases, but you, the wife, feel like, you know what, as a Christian, I can't. And so what happens? You get angry. If the wife responds selfishly by getting even or standing up for her rights, she will only cause more damage to the relationship oftentimes. But if she responds to the wrong done her by putting off irritation, envy, and anger, and putting on trust in the Lord in obedience and waiting patiently on him and, and, and having humility, having an awareness of her own inadequacy, but also of Christ's sufficiency. Uh, she'll go about her life, not in a spirit of self-pity, but if she will just delight herself in the Lord, her husband will look at her and in time, perhaps he will say, you know what? She's got something that I need. Maybe it'd feel better to take revenge and to get even. But what's the objective? It's to heal the relationship. And the best way to do that is by delighting yourself in the Lord and depending on him for the outcome. A husband such as one who abuses his wife uh, through the wife's Christ-like testimony may be brought to repentance and the marriage may be saved. But whatever the outcome, she will continue to enjoy the abundant peace that comes from the Lord. So the first principle is when the bad guys win, submit to the Lord. We will look at a couple of other principles next Wednesday night. But I hope you'll take the time to, uh, over the next few days, to meditate on these first 11 verses of Psalm 37 until they become uh, a vital part of your own thinking. May God bless you to that end.